Boa tarde a todos. Vamos continuar, então, com o nosso workshop. Vou chamar, então, agora a professora Silvia Cozolino, que vai dar continuidade ao terceiro painel. Boa tarde. É um prazer estar aqui. E eu gostaria, inicialmente, de parabenizar o Ilse por esse evento. Eu acho que ele está sendo bastante ilustrativo, bastante uh, trazendo ciência para que muitas das nossas dúvidas sejam elucidadas. Então, eu gostaria de já apresentar. O, o Dr. Craig Johnston já foi apresentado, mas eu vou repetir. Ele é, é, é psicologia na Iowa State University, Mestre em Psicologia Clínica pela Southwest Missouri State University eh, e tem doutorado em Psicologia Clínica Infantil na Universidade do Kansas. Foi professor auxiliar no Departamento de Medicina da Faculdade de Medicina de Baylor, Texas. Foi professor auxiliar no Departamento de Nutrição Infantil do Centro de Pesquisa em Nutrição da Criança, Faculdade de Medicina de Baylor, Texas. E atualmente é professor no Departamento de Performance e Saúde Humana da Universidade de Houston. E já apresento também o nosso segundo palestrante, que é o Dr. Peter Rogers. Dr. Peter Rogers. Ele é professor de psicologia biológica na Universidade de Bristol, Reino Unido, tem graduação em ciências biológicas e psicologia experimental na Universidade de Sucas, no Reino Unido, PhD e pós-doc na Universidade de Leeds, mudando para o Instituto de Pesquisa de Alimentos no Reino Unido, ingressou como professor na Universidade de Bristol, United Kingdom, em 1999, onde ensina psicologia biológica e é pesquisador em nutrição e comportamento. Trabalhos com apetite humano e controle de peso, psicofarmacologia da cafeína. É membro da Sociedade Real de Psicologia e nutricionista registrado. Então, é um prazer contar com professores tão renomados. Então, eu inicialmente, chamaria o Dr. Craig, que vai falar sobre educorantes e controle de peso. O que dizem as últimas evidências? Obrigada. Thank you so much and uh, um, uh, my apologies you have to listen to me twice today. Uh, but uh, especially right after lunch, that's always a hard one, right? But we'll, we'll see if we can uh, keep your attention as we get to talk about weight management. And I've already started to address that a little bit. Uh, I want to go into a, uh, some more detail about exactly what that looks like from my perspective and the role that low-calorie sweeteners can play in that as well. So everyone wants to know the answer to this question. What is the secret to losing weight? Um, what is it that I have to do? What is it that I should do? If you had to say one thing to do, and, and usually people have an opinion on this, and so you might want to think about what your opinion is, and uh, I'm going to tell you really what it comes down to for me. Uh, you need to eat less. Now, I put this picture up. This comes from the big Texan steak ranch, because in Texas we know how to do steak. But I had no idea until I ate at a Brazilian barbecue last night that maybe you all know how to do steak as well. Um, so it was absolutely delicious. And I thought that maybe only the United States had issues with uh, portion sizes and the amount of servings that you get. That's not true. You have that problem here in Brazil as well. Uh, so it was delicious. But one of the, one of the biggest keys that we're going to have to weight loss is that how do we find ways to eat less? Just very simply. Now that might be simple, but it is not easy. And um, so the other side of energy balance then is we need to exercise more. Um, and so um, for me, there's, there's real issues behind finding out how to, how to exercise more, right? Like um, we have all sorts of ways to be sedentary. As you'll see, the escalator going into a fitness center, right? Like we, we don't use steps. We have garage door openers. Uh, we did a study with, with adolescents, and we wanted to see some of our high-risk adolescents, how many steps they might take over the course of... Um, a weekend, 
And what we found on Saturdays for the lowest, for our, our group with the lowest amount of steps that they take, some of our kids take as few as 500 steps on a Saturday. Because really what they do is they wake up to sit in front of a TV, to get up to get something to eat, to go back in front of a TV, to go, to go play on their phone, to then go to bed at night. And so it's very possible because we can be entertained. Um, we don't have to get activity at all. Now, if you are from Texas, we like to drive big trucks. And so um, I, I don't know if that's actually exercise or not, walking the dog like that. Uh, but um, we, we, just, we, we've, we found creative ways to, to, to be sedentary. And so we have these kind of two issues. Uh, and, and we have to intervene at one part of this um, continuum, like we have to do energy balance by eating less or by exercising more. Now, a lot of folks would say, which, which one do you want to deal with the most? When people come in for weight loss interventions and we say, what goal do you want to set? Almost 90% of people will say, I want to set a goal on the exercising more continuum. Because we get anxious when we're asked to change foods. We don't want to change foods. We get, if someone told me to cut out some of my favorite foods, like we would get in a fight about that because I hold on very strongly to the foods that I like and the foods that I want to be able to engage with. And exercise, we don't have as much with that, uh, but the problem is it takes a lot of exercise in order for us to reduce calories. So what we'll, what, what we'll do today is, again, just a small changes approach. What is a, a very small way that we can make some shifts within our diet in order to say um, that we're trying to reduce overall caloric intake and, and therefore reduce our weight. And I want to be clear, when I say reduce weight, what I intend to say with that as well, for some of us, it's maintaining weight. As a matter of fact, even if, if, if an individual is overweight or obese, maintaining weight is a great goal. So just to stay weight stable um, is an incredibly important goal for many of us. And um, I, think, I think low calorie sweeteners can, can very much play a role in that. Now, they, they don't increase food intake, and, and we'll talk a little bit about that today. They don't significantly affect appetite, hunger, or desire for sweets. I think the preponderance of evidence sits with that. They don't cause weight gain in adults, and the only reason I don't have children there are there are very few studies with low-calorie sweeteners in children. And um, I think you'll see from the evidence that I present today that low-calorie sweeteners may help with modest weight losses. But before I, I get into that, what I'd, I'd like to just talk about um, this is a controversial issue, but it, it's been controversial for actually a very, very long time. And I'm going to give you some history in the United States about where some of this controversy came from, right? Constantin Fallberg was a chemist working in Ira Resman's laboratory, and he was studying the derivatives of coal tar. Um, now, what happened with, with Constantin is he was doing his studies, and he was taking notes, and he reached down and licked his fingers during one of his studies. And he came up with a very sweet taste on his fingers. And all of a sudden he realized like, oh, I have something that could be incredibly beneficial, especially because we have a sugar sh shortage that's going on during World War I. And so the, the production of this became widespread. Um, now, I, I told you that he worked in Ira, uh, Ira Resman's laboratory because Resman said, I'm not interested in doing the sweetness thing. Um, and then when um, Constantin made a lot of money on this, this is what Ira, Ira Resman had to say, Fallberg is a scoundrel and nauseates me to hear my name mentioned in the same breath with him. So even the production of this low-calorie sweetener started off with controversy, and then it followed up um, actually, in the U.S. government, right, there's a controversy in 1907. The director of the Food and Drug Administration, right, the director of the FDA at that time, said this about one of his friends. He thought he was eating sugar when, in point of fact, he was eating a coal tar product that was totally devoid of food value and extremely injurious to health. And Harvey Wiley, at this point, tried to say this will not be in production in the U.S. and nor will it be in food substances in the U.S. Now... Um, this is maybe one of my favorite quotes from maybe one of my favorite U.S. presidents. President Theodore Roosevelt's response, anyone who says saccharin is injurious to health is an idiot, right? And so, like, I think that's, uh, um, <laughs> I don't think he had the science to back that, to be honest with you, but uh, I love how he's just uh, uh, up front with it. And possibly one of the reasons is um, Teddy Roosevelt was a very big user of 
saccharin. Um, and so uh, we, we see controversy very early on. And then, as was discussed, all of a sudden a study came out that showed in rats that saccharin was related with cancer. And now we've already been walked through that that had to do with some things that were taking place in the urine of rats and that it was irritating the bladder wall and, and that's where... And so, but the study comes out and almost immediately um, the Saccharin Study and Labeling Act of 1977 gets instituted. And in the U.S. that meant that there had to be a warning label on everything with saccharin in it, saying that this may be injurious to your health and it may be related to causing cancer. It wasn't even six months after that that studies were coming out saying, no, this is just an issue with, with the rats that were used in, in this study. It took until the year 2000 for the Sweetness Act to come out to say that that warning label no longer needs to be put on it. So that's 23 years when really we knew the truth of this six months after the study was published. And, and so when we're thinking about this, when I think about this, I think to myself, why, why did it take so long? Why did it take so long to reverse something where the science was very clear? And really, there was scientific consensus on how this happened within saccharin. Because I think that this becomes a political issue, and this becomes um, a matter of faith and a matter of belief for many people. And for me, we always go to the science because the science is what will give us the answers that we're looking for in terms of human health. So aspartame is, is not without its issues, although the, I, the preponderance of studies, I think, take place within aspartame. Um, so Schlatter is working, um, and, and guess what he does? He's developing something for an anti-ulcer drug, and during that, um, he reaches down and licks his fingers and comes up with a sweet taste. Here's a take-home message that this is, has nothing to do with my talk, but I think it's important. If you're ever around chemists, I would really hesitate to shake their hands. Those guys must lick their fingers all the time, right? Um, and so that's disgusting. But um, I was at a scientific meeting and I received this email. And this is actually went out to a whole bunch of people. Um, and it says, if you are using aspartame, this is around 2000, um, right? And it gives you an idea of what aspartame is. And you suffer from fibromyalgia symptoms, spasms, shooting pains, numbness in your legs, cramps, vertigo, dizziness, headaches, tinnitus, joint pain, depression, anxiety attacks, slurred speech, blurred vision, or memory loss. You probably have aspartame disease. I still see this out there a little bit. Folks, there is no such thing as aspartame disease, nor has aspartame ever been shown to have these consequences. And yet this is still out within the public where people get nervous about these kinds of claims. Again, no scientific support for it, whatever. It doesn't take much for public opinion to be shifted to say we should be cautious of and I think there could be a whole bunch of different reasons that that, that might take place, right? Like, it, it really could be this idea of only natural things and only, I, I, I don't even know what they all could be. But again, for me, we go to the science and we look to what the science has to say. And, and we move away from this idea of this fear mongering that takes place, right? Like selling fear about substances. And in this case, it was done through really just a series of emails um, that somebody trying to be funny made up. Um, so, so do they cause weight gain? I always like to try to get something recent where somebody's saying low calorie sweeteners do this, right? And then there's a publication that's with it. And so there's, um, we get this evidence from somewhere, right? And we get this idea and you see it from, so this, this was an epidemiological study that took place and we've already talked about some of the issues with epidemiological studies. The real issue with epidemiological studies and weight gain is that when you look at people and you say, someone that's overweight or obese uses more low-calorie sweeteners, is more likely to drink a low-calorie sweetener drink, what folks in the past have done is said, like for every can of artificially sweetened soda, you gain this amount of weight. But what the real case may be 
is someone that's overweight or obese may be more likely to drink a low-calorie sweetener because they're trying to do something about their weight. We have no way to look at directionality with this. Um, in, in epidemiological studies, it is very difficult. And then it's very difficult to find if there's another intervening factor within that epidemiological study. So this study actually tried to address that idea of what, what's going on with people? Is it really that the low calorie sweetener, that's, we start with that and then it leads to weight gain, or is it just more likely to overweight and obese people drink low calorie sweeteners? And so what they did is they said, we did this complex statistical analysis, and this is what we find through this really um, right, difficult to understand statistics. They say low calorie sweeteners certainly have fewer calories. However, our study suggests that they may have metabolic activity that's pro-obesogenic right, that may support obesity, especially for abdominal obesity, and this hypothesis should be actively researched. And th the issue still remains of this idea of causality here, even, even if we're using statistics too, because the case may be that if somebody that started off at a normal weight and then their low calorie sweetener intake increases, that just may simply be because they're increasing weight over the course of time as well. The low calorie sweetener didn't actually cause the, the, the weight gain. And so, so we see these studies come out, we see them come out over and over again. And I think that it's important to think about why that is, like why might that take place? What makes low calorie sweetener such a low hanging fruit that people continue to say, I wanna go after that and I wanna study it and I wanna look at it. This last statement they make, this hypothesis should be actively researched. I want to show you how actively researched this hypothesis has already been. Okay, so this study came out in 2016, and we're going to go through some studies that really show you that this is probably not the case. Right? So these are randomized controlled trials. Again, this is the gold standard that we have for weight loss. What does it look like when we randomize people to different conditions? And so in this study by Blackburn, we see 163 obese women. And you either consume or abstain from aspartame sweetened foods and beverages. 16 weeks of a 19-week program. One-year maintenance with a two-year follow-up. Now, both groups lost about 10% during active treatment. Right? They came out with almost the same results during active. But the aspartame group lost significantly more weight overall. And they regained significantly less now, notice what I said there. They didn't even maintain those weight losses because in most studies of obesity, we don't see that people maintain the weight losses at a year or two years. What we find is we see this increase. And so anything that can decrease that increase is, is a good idea as well. And so they regain significantly less weight during maintenance and follow-up. So at a year and two years, they, they regain significantly less weight. So there's this idea of people that are actively trying to come about with weight loss, like we don't see this issue that I told you in this epidemiological study. Well, that's, that's not at all all of the evidence, right? So th this, is a, a, this is a blinded study that was done, right, by Tordoff et al., um, where they looked at 40 ounces of soda daily. One was sweetened with aspartame, one with high fructose corn syrup, and the other one had no soft drinks. What they found there was regular soda consumption, significantly higher daily intake. That's no surprise. There's calories in regular soda. Right? This is what we would expect. Reduce calories with a low calorie sweetener. The aspartame soda consumption, they showed decreases in body weight, although it wasn't significant, statistically significant, but you saw a slight decrease, which is again what we would expect. We don't expect, we don't expect people to move from the obesity category to the normal weight category because this is a small change approach. And the re regular soda consumption, they showed actual weight gain in women, right? because they were adding calories to the diet. It's not that big of a surprise. Um, the men didn't actually show that. Um, by the way, men have a little bit of a benefit in not gaining weight. It's called testosterone, and uh, we are just lucky enough to have that, and I'm sorry, women. Um, 41 overweight, obese subjects, 10 weeks of daily supplements of sucrose or aspartame delivered primarily as beverages. And again, they're going to find that almost the same thing again. 10 weeks, the aspartame group decreased significantly in body weight and blood pressure measures. Energy intakes increased significantly in the sucrose group. Uh, this, is, this is what we would all anticipate, I think. It just makes sense when we look at the calories that are being provided. Now, um, 
actually really, this is one of my favorite studies, and it's a recent one uh, that's come out. It, I, I think it's really clever. I think what they did is um, important. So what I hear all the time, why would you tell somebody to go on a low-calorie sweetener when really what they should be doing is drinking more water? To be clear, I'm going to give you the science, so you can come up with your own hypothesis on this, right? To be clear, water consumption is not associated with weight loss. In any study that we've ever done, people that, that recommend you to drink more water, it does not help with weight loss. It does not. It's been shown over and over and over again. But it is this really firmly held belief. Drink water. You may have even heard drink your body weight in ounces for us, right? Daily in water, and it will help with your body weight. That This recommendation is not based in science. It is simply myth that's out there. Um, people will also say if you're not well hydrated, you will seek hydration through the foods that you eat. Um, whereas that may be true, it doesn't actually exhibit itself in terms of weight. So, um, so you have that. So I want you to think about this study. People get randomized to either drink water or they get randomized to drink low-calorie sweeteners. Now, I will tell you, these are people that already have, are drinking low-calorie sweeteners, right? They do it, and they say, no, you need to switch to water. You need to continue to drink low-calorie sweeteners. Um, so which group did better? 